by Yaga. Written by Bog Z. Edited and amended by Reviler. Narrated by Bog Z and Reviler. Baba Yaga. In the depths of the seemingly interminable forests, there lies a path of broken twigs and slightly bent bushes, so untraveled that even the meticulously sharp eye of the keenest hunter would miss it. The contrast between the path and the unwalked grass can only be glimpsed as the light wanes at sundown, with the sun's last dying rays revealing its clandestine visage. If one were to begin to traverse it, he or she would perceive the way in which the trees lean closer together, bowing towards each other, almost conspiratorially, as if whispering unknowable secrets among themselves. As one continues down it, he or she would never notice the trees behind gradually closing in, obstructing the formerly perceivable entrance to the path. By the time the journey begins, it is already too late to turn back. The path twists and winds through increasingly dense forest, the sun becoming ever harder to perceive through the ever-thickening branches, plotting as they do to make its radiant light a dull haze, and ultimately, a distant memory. The path leads hundreds of kilometers beyond the places where even the bravest hunters dare venture, inching ever forward, seemingly endlessly. As one continues the journey, he or she will begin to feel the pangs of hunger and thirst, which may impel a course of action to attempt to turn back. If this circumspect feat is attempted, the traveler will be doomed, for the now extant path, formerly behind them, will not allow for retreat. Furthermore, if he or she instead attempts to veer off of it, a fatally, hopelessly lost fate awaits. All electronics will be found to be flat dead in response if inspected, with batteries mysteriously and entirely drained, even if fully charged previously, and the needle of one's compass will spin around incessantly as if possessed. If, on the other hand, one had planned to stay a few days in the woods prior to the damned excursion, and had the foresight to have brought sufficient food and water, as well as adequately warm clothing with them, then the more keen traveler can instead continue on their trek forward into the wilderness. Hours will pass and surely turn into days, though time will be impossible to accurately gauge due to the sky being completely obstructed by the sinister branches overhead. Attempting to cut or burn them will only result in whatever damage planned for the plant life being incurred by the woeful traveler, marring their own body instead. Days after the last of one's rations run out, and delirium sets in from the lack of food and water, he or she will start to hear queer whispering and faint laughter deep in the forest. One may also see peculiar lights off in the distance of the woods, attracting the inexperienced and the weak-willed. Yet none of this should be paid any heed. Instead, the traveler should remain steadfast, continually traversing the path regardless of trepidation, starvation, hypothermia, or thirst. A single step off of it means to wander lost until death from exposure. Finally, after countless days spent walking, the trees will slowly start thinning out, and if one observes the plant life around them closely, they will find that an ever-increasing number of them are dead, rotting where they stand. The sounds of the forests will too fade, an awful dead silence hanging over the earth, like a melancholic, morbid angel of rot, hearkening the impending oblivion. Eventually, all will be silent, and the cool, formerly frigid winds too shall cease. Not even branches underfoot will emit a sound as the traveler steps upon them, and as one looks around, he or she will note that some of the dead trees stand with bones of various origin adorning their sullen, warped branches, some clearly belonging to that of a bear or a deer, and some that are more difficult to ascertain as anything other than human. At long last, one will come to a clearing, 
where a gate marked by prongs of human legs, beset with skulls atop the spiked legs, bolts of arms, and a lock of razor-sharp, cavity-stricken teeth in the center sits. Upon gazing up at the morbid gate, its rotten, bloody stench not diminished in spite of the biting cold, one will suddenly see the eye sockets of the numerous skulls all illuminate at once, causing the sharp-toothed lock to abate and swing the gates wide open, allowing for passage. Beyond the haze, and at a distance, now in full view, a lone yet massive cabin stands at an impressive height, far above that of eye level, without any visible doorway or entrance. Both dead and living trees surround it, amid the snow. It spins, almost impossibly so, yet at the same time appearing partially rooted to the rotted foul ground. As one looks closer at its base, he or she will see that its foundation is constructed of bone. Halfway around its base, one can see dead foliage and charred bones scattered to and fro. The top half, however, in sharp contrast, is in full bloom with exotic flowers, mystic mushrooms, and tall green grass, touching any of which spells certain death. One must be careful to be prepared for this sight and not to exclaim in shock. Instead, one must confidently exclaim, Izbushka, Izbushka! Повернись ко мне передом, к лесу, зад. The cabin shall then move obediently, gradually halting its dizzying spinning and turning on its macabre foundation towards the traveler. The doorway will appear like a yawning black hole, upon which no light shines and through which nothing can escape, with massive chicken-like legs kneeling on the ground parallel to either side of its entrance, ostensibly part of the strange, beguiling structure. Nevertheless, the doorway must not be approached directly, lest a fate worse than death befall the foolish one who haphazardly enters ill-prepared. Instead, one ought to take out a roll of thread, prick oneself with a needle, and silently bleed upon the piece of thread. Then, the traveler must cast the roll out towards the cabin, and must be careful to walk only where the thread makes contact with the ground, or if the structure suddenly elevates in height with the giant chicken legs moving from a kneeling to a standing position, then he or she must climb the thread which will seemingly impossibly support his or her weight like a thin rope ladder. To fall is to fall into eternity, as is to stray off the thread's narrow path period. Following the thread towards or up through the abyss, one will pass between the realms of both the living and the dead, and finally enter the void. As one passes through its entrance, he or she will come into its singular room, where time stands completely still, a place of utter numinosity. The room will be wrapped in the shroud of darkness which is pitch black, even when compared to the blackness of the outside night, with proportions that oddly stretch up to a ceiling inconceivably far above. When one's eyes finally adjust, one will be able to barely make out a sole figure at the end of the room, surrounded by various objects, amongst which only bones will be recognizable. The figure's stature will be obscenely tall and gaunt, resembling that of a skeleton in its proportions. When one stares long enough at the figure, it will appear alternatively as both a beautiful young woman and as a hideous old crone, its immense height remaining steady, but the crone's visage endowed with an eerily long, pointed, seemingly metallic nose, smelling strongly of iron, blood, and rot. To attempt to move forward without being asked to by the figure will result in immediate death by impalement by means of the sharp nose, regardless of one's agility. To attempt to turn back at this stage will result in a plummet into eternity once the doorway in which he or she came through is again breached. The image and sense both that of delectable spring and that of foul rotten meat will waver between the two juxtapositions incessantly.
When the figure speaks, its voice will sound in the same manner simultaneously as both the lilt of a young woman and that of the croaking, shuddering growl of the dead. The voice will resonate within one's head, both audibly and almost telepathically, paradoxically both contained in the location of its origin, yet seemingly cascading everywhere. It will sound like the entire universe is screaming, but conversely like the faintest whisper with each glorious yet somehow foul syllable. It will ask the intruder to complete a task in hypnotic tones that will make one feel like their singular life purpose is to simply say yes and acquiesce obsequiously with an allure greater than that of any drug. If they accept, they will be devoured. After a seemingly eternal constriction of time passes, the figure from the shadows will repeat their request, which will resonate with a crushing force throughout the intruder's head and body, a fearful symmetry, a gale like the strongest hurricane against which one can have no hope of prevailing. If one's will breaks, they will be enslaved forever. Yet if one somehow manages to withstand this onslaught and again declines to respond, they will be queried the same thing a final time, only this time it will feel like a question posed by an intimate lover, a seemingly cooing suggestion without a modicum of demand. If one fails to respond this time, he or she will be thrust out at once, finding his or her body intact in a clearing close to his or her home. If, however, the traveler, now a celestial voyager, wishes to continue, he or she must now satiate the demand, no matter what is asked. The request might be next to impossible, if not entirely so. That much is certain. But what is asked specifically is unknowable, as it is not conveyable through any language. It may be to betray what one believes in, or to solve a sphinx-like riddle that has no solution, or perhaps it is something both physically and astrally impossible. It could be delineated as a demand to go somewhere that is impossible to locate, or to navigate and bring back that which has no name or description, or, on the contrary, it could be some menial, entirely doable task. All tasks are given a deadline of three physical Earth days, and failure means immediate death. Yet prior to acceptance of whatever feat is demanded, to whatever pact is made with the Voyager, the insidious being, and the universe to attain his or her deepest wish or longing, stated in full and multiplicitous only if directly interrelated and not capable of altering the fabric of the universe, including that of the Earth, or the space-time continuum itself too significantly, then the Voyager will feel their body suddenly and seemingly miraculously replenished in every way, nourished, quenched, and physically strong, seemingly ready to accomplish whatever task lies ahead. If the Voyager somehow manages to complete the ostensibly impossible or eminently reasonable task and returns upon successful completion, he or she will find that the path originally traveled has now disappeared entirely, but that a new one has indeed opened up. Regretfully, though, the very same treacherous trees from before, although in a seemingly different location, will now seem to reach out with their roots and branches, both to ensnare and trip him or her, sending the brave voyager to join the dead beneath the ground. These roots and branches may only now be cut or burnt, with no risk of damage being incurred by the onward-pressing voyager. Similarly, he or she will both hear and feel the icy wind howl against and attempt to push him or her back, and that the sum of all of nature, as well as that of the seemingly unnatural, conspires to prevent the voyager from pushing onward. 
The Voyager's remaining food will rot, his or her water will turn to poison, and in short time, the Voyager's legs will give out from under them. If the intrepid Voyager were to return despite everything having previously been turned against him or her, it is said that the host of the cabin, the original being of both Zul beauty and horrid age, will grant any desire or wish aforementioned. This could entail the healthy revival of the dead, procuring the undying love of a new or old partner in life or death to last the eons, the turning of lead into gold, the transfigurement of the ugly or deformed into that of the most radiantly beautiful, or the making of the beautiful hideous. Or, the host could bring any of one's enemies to an untimely demise, grant immortality, or bring infinite luck. The catch is that only one wish or interrelated series of partitions of a wish therein, those not undoing of the earth, universe, time, matter as a whole, or space itself, may ever be granted, and that to agree to this bargain is to sell one's soul to the cabin's host. Lucky is the stalwart traveler who has succeeded, at least for a time, or, if immortality is chosen, for all of time, that is, until time itself is ended, if it in fact ever is, but either way, his or her soul would inexorably be claimed by the host nonetheless, swept up with a life-sized pestle into a giant mortar, the bones and ashes of both voyagers and foes of the host are ultimately interred, remains which the host subsists off of and adorns her morbid estate with forevermore. In spite of all of this, the foolish still wander, looking for that unseeable path, seeking to set down a road from which one may never return unchanged, pure, or whole, all for their most coveted desires and dreams. Such is Baba Yaga. Берегись, Баба Ягы, проклятый ведьми лесов. Берегись, Баба Яги, которая измельчивает наши кости и души своим пестиком. 